Now we are going to uh, go to the first speaker. I'm very honored to introduce Professor Giuseppe Mancia. Uh, he is going to address uh, the topic of the growing contribution of real life data to hypertension research, a very important topic. And um, I'm sure we are going to hear uh, a very uh, uh, a fruitful uh, uh, data and uh, uh, um, I'm eager to have a lot of discussion about it. As Ladies Professor and gentlemen, mentioned. distinguished colleagues, yeah. the title of my presentation takes you to the future. That is, uh, which types of research uh, will be with us uh, in the future to resolve the multiple problems uh, of uh, hypertension and antihypertensive treatment? And let me start with uh, one statement uh, with which you, I'm sure, will entirely agree. That is that the best type of evidence we have uh, to document uh, the effectiveness of antihypertensive treatment uh, is uh, the data from randomized clinical trials. Because in randomized clinical trials, uh, randomization uh, allows uh, the groups which are compared for the effectiveness of different treatments uh, to be similar at the beginning of treatment. And so we can rather safely ascribe the effect of the treatment under study to the effect of the treatment under study without the confounding effect of some differences in baseline clinical values. But randomized clinical trials are not a perfect type of research, unfortunately. They do have some limitations, and I've listed some of these limitations here. For example, in order to be scientifically valid, they had to restrict the recruitment criteria of the patients. They cannot uh, study simultaneously people 90 years old and 18 years old, for example. Usually, some categories are excluded from trials, for example, frail patients, because they do not have guarantee to come to the visits. Treatment strategies are rigid. Uh, even if one uh, treatment is not effective because of the protocol, it is kept uh, as treatment uh, in the patient. And then, of course, the study makes use uh, of uh, operators with superior competence and control environment. Uh, and the adherence to treatment is high because patients are under pressure and inertia is low. And the cost of trials are extremely high and it takes years to have the results of trials. And just as a last note, just to give you an idea of the limitations of trials, the trials for organizational reasons can only last maybe four, five, six years. And then we have to apply the data from trials for lifetime and life expectancy of the patients can be 30, 40 years. And this is of course, is a major extrapolation to think that the data ob obtained over five years are valid also after 30 years. Now, because of this, uh, a number of different uh, sources of research and different research approaches have been uh, uh, devised in these years. The so-called pragmatic trials, they are like uh, old trials, except they are a little bit uh, more permissive in terms of uh, patients' recruitment and also measurements uh, on which uh, trial results are based. Then we have registries, which are becoming more and more popular. Then I have the biobanks, and some of them are really incredibly good. For example, the UK biobank. In some countries, the biobanks includes uh, virtually the whole population. And then the healthcare utilization database, administrative databases, uh, which uh, allow a number of data to be recorded. Uh, for example, all drugs reimbursed by the National Health Service, uh, all medical performances, including hospitalizations, but also private, also visits uh, from the National Health Service. Uh, 
And uh, now these data are available since the last 15, 20 years. So we can really have uh, this type of information over a long time. And uh, in countries like Italy, in which the public health service, uh, all citizens are cured by the National Health Service, uh, of course, the entire population is included in the database. In the Lombardy database, for example, all 10 million are part of this database. Now, which are the fields of research? Well, compared to randomized trials, of course, the heterogeneity of the population is uh, much, much greater in uh, administrative databases because it includes the whole population. And this is an advantage uh, when we try to have more evidence on individualization of treatment uh, and precision medicine because we can count on a large heterogeneous population. Then these data are provided at a low cost because they are already there and they can be quickly obtained because it takes only calculation which can be done in a matter of weeks or months. And the number of bigs, we're talking about data from million people. And this is uh, the areas uh, of uh, application, probably underestimated. But just one thing I would like to mention, these data have been extremely useful in the recent COVID pandemia in which of course there could have been no data whatsoever from randomized clinical trials. But I would like to make two specific examples of the possible use and growing use of this approach in future research. One is adherence to treatment and therapeutic inertia. These are major phenomenon for antihypertensive treatment and responsible for the poor rate of blood pressure control in clinical practice. But clinical trials are not an optimal approach for these problems because uh, patients are closely followed and doctors are closely followed in trials. And this means that inertia is low and adherence is very high, uncharacteristically high compared to clinical practice. You have here data from uh, a meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials, and you can see that the different types of treatment for all of them, the average adherence was 80% of the perfect adherence time, which is inconceivable in clinical practice in which unfortunately adherence is much low, lower. And you have an example here. These are data from the Lombardy database on about 800,000 newly treated hypertensive patients. And this is the rate of discontinuation of treatment over the chronic treatment of the patients, amounted to 63% of the patients. And overall, only one out of four patients had the coverage of antihypertensive treatment for more than 75% of the follow-up time. So you can see that this uh, is the reality which can only be studied in real life conditions, uh, certainly not in trials. And this is an example of low inertia. You can see that people who had the prescription of a monotherapy at the beginning, they were followed for three years. Uh, and after three years, only one third of them had moved to combination treatment. Totally against the guidelines recommendations we recommend in the end to have the vast majority of the patients on combination treatment. But these databases can give us, can give us important information also on factors possibly involved in different types of adherence to treatment. Uh, and we have indeed investigated the number of factors. I cannot go into detail, but just showing that some of the factors uh, were in a way easily interpretable. For example, patients uh, who had uh, in their history hospitalization for cardiovascular or renal disease uh, they had a better adherence to antihypertensive treatment compared to patients who did not have these hospitalizations. But on the other hand, patients who in the history had hospitalization for rheumatic diseases, 
respiratory diseases or cancer. Well, in this case, uh, adherence to antihypertensive treatment was lower because probably priority, healthcare priority for them was different from treating their hypertension. But uh, we came across also some unexpected findings uh, which can tell you how useful can be this approach. And this was true not only for antihypertensive treatment, but also for hypolipemic uh, starting treatment, basically, and anti-diabetic treatment. You have a colorimetric scale here. And the red color, dark red, indicates lower adherence to treatment on a colorimetric scale, whereas the uh, pink color indicates a better adherence to treatment. And this is the map of Lombardy with Milan and with other cities in Lombardy. And it is immediately evidence that adherence was lowest in metropolitan areas compared to less densely populated areas. Now, we do not have an explanation for this. We can uh, speculate that uh, in more rural countries, uh, uh, being visited by the doctor or seeing the doctor or meeting the doctor even casually could be easier than in metropolitan areas in which even transportation can be a problem. But this is an example of how something which nobody thought of could come out from data in real life. But the second example I would like to make is that this approach may also help us to fill gaps in knowledge about uh, whether antihypertensive treatment is protective in a number of conditions in which trials have never been made. We do not have trials proving the protective effect of antihypertensive treatment in patients younger than 40 years. We do not have trial in resistant hypertensive patients. We have trials showing that blood pressure is reduced, but no trials showing that reduction translates uh, into cardiovascular protection. We don't have trial in white coat hypertension, 30% of the hypertensive population, or in mast hypertension, people having out of office blood pressure increase, but not office blood pressure increase. We do not have trial in frail patients. Guidelines as far as frail patients are concerned, they tell doctors, well, you do whatever you think is better because there are no data coming from trials. Just to give you some examples. Well, one approach to this problem, to have at least an idea what antihypertensive treatment can do in these categories in which uh, no trial is available, is to measure adherence uh, because adherence is related to the risk of cardiovascular events. The higher is adherence, the lower is the incidence of cardiovascular events, as you can see in this study. And patients discontinuing treatment, they have a much greater incidence of cardiovascular events than patients continuing treatment. So if we measure adherence and find that there is a difference in the risk of cardiovascular events between high adherence and low adherence, well, this could suggest uh, the treatment is beneficial because if they're not beneficial, then there would be no difference between low adherence and high adherence. And we have examined the number of people, different categories uh, from the Lombardy database. For example, these were subjects aged uh, 70 to 84 years, but also above 84 years with an average age of 90 years no data from trial in nonagenarians. And you can see that there was indeed a difference. The greater was adherence to treatment, the lower was the risk of uh, hospitaliz hospitalization for myocardial infarction, heart failure, or stroke. This suggests, and I use the word suggest because these are not trials, but observational studies, that indeed, in, even in nonagenarians, antihypertensive treatment can be beneficial. And then we look at frail patients. We divided our population in four groups according to the risk of dying over a number of years. Those having a small risk and then progressively 
up to those having a very high risk of mortality, 70% risk uh, in seven years. And we define them as being frail patients. And look at what happened in the risk of hospitalization for cardiovascular events or mortality in these four different categories. And I would like you to see that uh, the greater was adherence, the lower was the risk of, in this case, old cause mortality in the four different groups. And the high adherence to treatment was also capable of reducing mortality in the so-called frail patients with a very high mortality rate. And of course, we did the same type of study, not only on antihypertensive treatment, but also on lipid lowering treatment and anti-diabetic treatments, and the data were very similar. In patients uh, with a very high mortality rate, uh, well, as you can see, the risk of uh, mortality was uh, dependent uh, on adherence to treatment. Uh, even in the so-called very poor clinical patients with a very high mortality, in this particular case, it was uh, starting. Uh, you can see that the better was adherence, the lower was the risk of mortality. And this was the case also in patients above 80 years of age. So even those very frail with an extremely high mortality rate, uh, if they had a better adherence to, in this case, lipid lowering treatment, uh, they had the reduced risk of mortality. And this is the same type of data for antihypertensive treatment. So the conclusion for this study was that it is possible that even if patients are very frail, the treatment we use in less frail patients, uh, antihypertensive treatment, lipid lowering treatment, or anti-diabetic treatment can have some degree of protective effect. And this is uh, something to be taken into account in future research because uh, statisticians have now progressed a lot in terms of calculation of data. And the confounding effect uh, of observational studies, which are traditionally considered a limitation of observational study approaches, uh, well, it can be minimized by a number of statistical means, uh, which uh, I'm not going to go into in detail, except for one possibility, that the main, the main uh, limitation for this approach has been uh, the fact that we normally compare two series of patients, of different series of patients, and the question is whether these series are identical or the beginning, something which is guaranteed by trial, but not by observational studies of uh, administrative databases. But as I mentioned in one of the earliest slides, we have uh, long-term databases now, real-life databases. And so we can compare in a number of conditions, uh, the same patients taking one treatment in some years and another treatment in the other year. So the comparison is done within patients and this uh, eliminates at the root uh, the limitations uh, I just mentioned. And I just show you one example and this is my last slide. What we did was to look at what happened to elderly patients uh, started treatment with the antihypertensive agent uh, as far as hospitalization for hip fracture, assuming that hospitalization for hip fracture meant uh, indirectly injurious falls, uh, and this indirectly meant uh, orthostatic hypotension. Well, what happened with different treatments for the month following the treatment initiation? And data were done by comparing different series of patients, by also comparing the same patients, uh, taking one drug at a given time uh, and no drug at another time, randomly selected. Now, what happened, as you can see, is that uh, people starting treatment with alpha blockers, but also with loop diuretics, elderly people, they had uh, 
a clear-cut increase in risk of being hospitalized for hip fracture for the following month. And this was the case also when a within comparison patient was done. So the criticism of this approach was uh, eliminated by the type of analysis. And I hope that this type of analysis will grow and grow in the future in order to cover the gaps in evidence we still have as far as not only antihypertensive treatment, uh, but uh, prevention of uh, cardiovascular events in general is concerned. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Manchet. Uh, an Hello. excellent uh, 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 lecture, actually. Uh, I, I'd like to, to, um, uh, to ask you if uh, large databases can give us uh, such an more important information and uh, 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 give us the opportunity to do a deeper research uh, on individualized patients and on very large communities. What would be the electronic platforms uh, on the mobile applications? Would they give us uh, a more uh, uh, data on uh, the day-by-day -day variation in blood pressure? And uh, would this give us an, uh, another way of research? Well, the, the horizon is extremely wide. It depends, of course, on the nature of the database. Some databases have less clinical information than other databases. But of course, uh, we can see a future in which uh, this type of information, the one you alluded to, could be available. Not only, but if we are allowed to be a bit visionary, I think uh, we can see a future in which uh, uh, a good fraction of this information can be made available <clears throat> to the uh, for the patient bedside in a way to the to the practicing physician immediately in a way. Uh, so I think in the future we do have this uh, uh, very ambitious in a way, but uh, extremely promising approach. Uh, 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 some countries in which uh, the whole population is involved in this approach, for example, Sweden, in which data are collected from the entire population, they think that the future databases like this can also allow to perform trials uh, based on this databases, not recruiting patients and waiting 10 years before having the results, you see. So the uh, horizon uh, is uh, extremely wide, but I believe it is uh, indeed uh, the future of research because uh, uh, limiting our horizon to randomized clinical trials, uh, it is more and more clear that uh, uh, we had a, a big price to pay because uh, a lot of questions could not be answered by clinical trials. Think, for example, the trials uh, allow us to have information about cardiovascular prevention limited to four, five, six years. And then we have to apply the data to people uh, life expectancy, which could be 30 years, uh, even more. And so we need the big extrapolation to believe that data collected over five years are also valid in the remaining 30 years. And do I think we need to overcome this uh, limitation? <clears throat> um, hi, sir. We uh, enjoyed very much your presentation. This is Gamila Nashan, the head of cardiology department, Zeus Canal, uh, University of Egypt. And uh, I'm just uh, asking you about the under uh, representation of women in many clinical trials over over the world, and uh, last uh, last we witnessed uh, an, a paper published in the Lancet, which uh, stated that uh, the Egyptian women had uh, a really uh, back threat to be hypertensive, and maybe they uh, recorded one of the highest rates over the, all over the world. What do you think? How we can tackle this problem regarding research, regarding yeah. prevention? Thank you. This is another limitation of trials, which I did not list in my second slide, uh, but it is indeed an important limitation because uh, not so much uh, 
the the number of women versus men because uh, men in trials were slightly more common than women but the fact that of course women had the less events so many trials were under power to look at the effect of whatever was the treatment and the study uh, on the risk of cardiovascular events and mortality in women and uh, I'm not sure that meta-analysis, which are very common today, but uh, perhaps too common, can really cope uh, with these limitations and uh, overcome uh, these limitations. But of course, when we have million people studied in the natural environment, uh, uh, there will not be this uh, limitation for sure. <clears throat> We have a question from the floor, sir. Shukran. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor uh, Gassopi. Uh, I would uh, wonder uh, if studying the intermediate uh, behavior of the care provider will give us a better insight and better valid data from the analysis of large data. For example, if I would study the, uh, uh, the behavior and whether there's a much of inertia in our care providers uh, from these data so that I would create um, a model, whether this is an auto intelligence models that might be incorporated in the, uh, in the softwares that help us to improve their behaviors so that we can continuously having uh, some interventions, uh, feeding the auto intelligence and seeing the results. I mean, our intervention would be as well based on data interventions and auto intelligence. Well, this is very interesting point. Uh, you touched a very interesting point because in fact, uh, one of the initial purposes of the databases was uh, uh, to check uh, what happened uh, uh, with the doctor's behavior as far as uh, uh, the cost of healthcare was concerned because uh, the cost of healthcare in a country with public health care like Italy, I mean, is overwhelming, overwhelming really. And uh, um, for example, uh, what appeared from our data was some differences in inertia and the big differences in inertia and big differences in adherence uh, to treatment uh, in different areas of the region. And, uh, and of course, it would have been very interesting for the health authorities to try to see why this was the case. And another possibility is to see what is the time uh, course of this, whether you can see an improvement of a worsening over time. So this would be a great means uh, to check uh, how the healthcare system is working. Uh, uh, perhaps I don't need to tell you that uh, from this point of view, I mean, uh, health authorities were not interested in our data. They we published uh, the data in uh, scientific journals, but uh, there was uh, really no use of these data from health authorities, but I'm sure that uh, uh, in the future, this will be unavoidable. Thank you very much, Professor Manchat. Uh, uh, it was a very fruitful uh, uh, meeting with you. And uh, I, I do, uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, uh, thank you very much for your contribution. It was thank a pleasure, you. thank you.